usual rules today. Uh, if you want to just ask a question or make a comment, you can still free to on the way through. I started out by uh, saying I was going to talk about applied psychological research. I think that's the title you were given. And then I thought, my goodness, that's a broad topic. <laughs> I've been actually focused on something that I know a little bit more of. And as you'll see, I'm going to focus it even more um, in this particular um, talk today. So I don't know to the extent to which the extent to which it's going to be relevant to all of your research projects. I hope that you might be able to take something away from it, um, even if you're not in this area. So the criteria for a quality piece of research, uh, many of them are the same across um, uh, both laboratory and applied research. Um, the importance of the issue, whether it's theoretical or applied or both. The usual ethical principles of risk to participants, and don't forget the risk to researchers, we'll come back to that later. Being minimised and outweighed by the social and individual benefit, and design, measurement, replicable procedure, and um, control of potential compounds. But in an applied project, typically the applied significance is, is more emphasised. Um, I say more emphasised because I don't think it, I don't think you should be neglecting the theoretical interest that you have from the particular project, but um, obviously that we apply this to the core. Um, ethical issues can be more complex um, for a number of reasons. I did a study um, a few years back that involved uh, doing some, uh, some testing in a dozen uh, different hospital districts in Queensland. Every ethics committee wanted to look at it separately. And they all had differing requirements, some of them conflicting with each other. It actually cost me $40,000 to just get it through this X. And it was a $60,000 grant. <laughs> so that was a bit of a problem. Um, uh, you often have vulnerable samples. Um, and there's a question sometimes about whether they're able to give informed consent, but I think sometimes ethics committees really go a bit overboard on this issue. Um, so I've done studies, for example, with people with substance misuse and acute psychotic um, episodes. Um, as long as you are explaining it very clearly, um, they are perfectly able to give informed consent. Um, similarly, we're a little bit less, I don't know what your ethics committee is like, but certainly in Australia now there is a great recognition that adolescents can give informed consent without needing to sign on. Um, it depends on the issue and sometimes um, sometimes, in fact, it's not to their advantage to go and tell their parents about the fact that they're drug using or whatever. So, um, under those circumstances, frequently we can get an agreement to be able to to, um, to, to have them give informed consent. The critical issue is whether they can understand um, what they're in for and what the implications of it are. As long as you can show that, um, you can often get through. But it varies across jurisdiction, and you might find it in the UK sometimes. Um, the treatment itself can produce problems. Um, so-called iatrogenic just means problems arising from the treatment. So if you're doing a drug trial, typically there are some side effects or risks attached to that. And even with psychological interventions, sometimes that can be the case. And it's really important that you look for them and that you report them if they occur. Um, we've sometimes dealt with really quite difficult uh, populations, so people with quite severe alcohol dependence. In that in that context, if they come off the alcohol very quickly, they can have a withdrawal syndrome, which can be quite dangerous. Um, but in the context of somebody in a remote cattle station who will not be able to get access to any other treatment, it's better that they're involved in a study that we're doing remotely than getting nothing at all. So um, we give them advice on how to deal with that, to not actually cut down quickly and to tell them what symptoms to look for and how to get help. Um, sometimes people are worried about suicides with depression studies. We have had people attempt suicide in our studies. I've even had a person commit suicide. Um, the important thing is whether it is due to the treatment that you are giving or whether it's something that would have happened in any way. And you need to be having procedures that try to ensure that the risk of that is low and that you're able to deal with the risk and with the aftermath should it occur. Um, confidentiality, of course, assumes um, greater significance here. Um, most of us would prefer others 
don't know that um, we're um, in a psychological treatment for um, a very severe mental disorder, for example, or a substance use problem. Um, and so it's really important that we're very protective of that. Now, I've been doing some treatments of these things on the web. Um, and there are obviously security issues connected with that. When everybody, whenever anybody is remotely connecting, whenever we are storing their confidential data, there's always a risk that someone could hack into that. So all we can do is actually provide the best protections that we can, ensure that um, the software that we're using is, uh, it is giving the best um, protection against um, spyware and so on that we can possibly give. Your health and safety is also really more difficult in this context. Um, so if you're doing a study where you're going out to test people in their homes, and you're young and female, and you're testing males, there is a risk attached to that when you're going out there particularly late at night, something like that. So how do you deal with that? Well, we deal with that in a couple of ways. We try to ensure that the person who's going out always lets us know uh, when they're going. They have a phone. They call us before and after the visit. And if there's any sort of significant risk, that we ensure that they're going with someone else. But you have to think these things through. Um, I had a Thai student who was doing, doing some work with um, uh, drug and alcohol misuse in little villages in Thailand. And what she was doing was doing this work with the families of the person in the village hall. A um, couple of issues there. The person concerned may not have been particularly happy about the fact that she was working with their family members because it wasn't consent from that person. It was the support of the family. So if they were very upset about it, they could pose a risk, particularly if they're intoxicated. We don't know about the hall. Um, was the hall fire safe? The person is, is conceivably putting themselves at significant risk, just in terms of the travel um, to and from. You, know, you need to think about the, the risks in terms of the, the car travel and so on that you're posing here. There are significant challenges in control and measurement. I'm going to go into those in a bit more detail to give you um, some idea of these things. And sometimes the, the, the actual practical issues are more challenging. So, can you get the people that you want is often a really major issue. By the way, if you're doing research like this, don't ever believe the person at the referral centre. Don't ever believe them. If they tell you that they've got 200 people, you might get five. Um, what happens is that the person who you're talking to, it's not that they're lying to you, sometimes they do, but it's, it's usually not that. It's, it's more a matter of the fact that they're thinking about people with depression. You want people with depression who don't also have schizophrenia, who don't also have severe alcohol dependence and all those other things that, in fact, uh, will be cutting those out. When they say they've got 200, half of those are coming back again after six months. And you're only wanting that one person, so you can't double count. And there may be other reasons why they're not going to come in, like, for example, they don't want to be in your study. So it's very difficult sometimes to actually get the flow of people that you're wanting to get into your study. Um, the research team needs to be able to deal with some of the complex issues that are going to be coming up in this project. So you need to be thinking very carefully about the capabilities of everybody on the team. And the budget sometimes can be really quite large, can really blow out. We, we were doing a study in remote Northern Territory, which involved going into these remote locations and um, being alongside people as they're coming in. And Indigenous people are coming in with colds and flu and whatever talking to them about their alcohol use in the context of that, and trying to train up the local staff. Okay. Now, in, in, uh, in Northern Australia, they have a dry season and a wet season. In the wet season, when you're driving out there, the roads are flooded. Okay, you can't get out there sometimes. <coughs> then we had a difficulty. The Indigenous men would only speak to um, male uh, staff. So we had to send both a male and a female staff member out. We sent them out in the caravan because there, there wasn't anywhere for them to stay in this remote location. And the male and the female staff member, of course, didn't want to sleep in the same caravan. So we had all kinds of difficulties, practical difficulties with this. We were just totally blow the budget. And with that kind of study, you could be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars just getting a very small study done. Um, okay, then, okay, so let's, let's just go through some of the, the basic designs. And forgive me, this part of the talk is very preliminary. And You'll know about this problem. So if you're wanting the perspective, perspectives of the respondents, 
you really do need to have a qualitative approach where you, you're going in there and actually, it's great for hypothesis generation and it's great when you don't know all the things that you want to be looking for. Because if you just go in with a quantitative approach, you're going to be missing a whole lot of things that the person could possibly be responding to you with. So, for example, a, a, uh, a student of mine was doing a study on CARVA and looking at the effects of CARVA on um, anxiety. Um, there are some known side effects from CARVA, but he, didn't act, he wasn't sure that he had them all. So what he decided to do was just to ask some open-ended questions and do a, a small qualitative study at the end of his randomised controlled trial to see whether he was picking up all of the effects of the drugs um, in that approach. Now, that's a, that's a more focused one because it's really a um, you know, very clear sort of notion of what it is you're going for. Sometimes in these studies you really don't know what it is that you're looking for. Um, and, and you need to be very open in what is your experience of this. And, and sometimes uh, it, it's much more of that kind of uh, approach. And you may know in terms of the analytic methods, um, that there's, a, there's a wide range of this. That some of them, what I think of as the, the left-wing sort of version of this, is that there is no reality. There is, there is only people's subjective experience. Um, it's not a, it's, you can never get anything that's, that's more accurate because there is no ultimate reality that you're looking for as against the other end of the spectrum, where, in fact, you might believe that there is some degree of, of uh, you know, reality that you're looking for, it's just you don't know what it is. You might be looking um, at an epidemiological study, where you're looking at the incidence of something, or looking at its correlates or predictors. Um, if it's cross-sectional, you're really just making some guesses about what might be going on. If you, if you want to be looking for possible causal relationships, you need to be looking at a longitudinal study. And, and in some cases, they're lifelong, these longitudinal studies. You've probably seen some of them being focused on, on television <coughs> programs and so forth. Um, and it gives you really rich data on, on what the developmental process is of particular problems or, or, or characteristics of people and what might be related to that. You might be refining a measure. And some of the recent work that I've been doing has been looking at development of, of measures, and one of them with um, Jackie and John. Um, we're looking at the psychometric characteristics, that the reliability of it. If, you, if, you're, um, if you're doing something which is uh, involving some, some uh, observer rating, you need to be looking at inter-rating reliability. The internal consistency of it. How, how much does do all of the items in this self-report measure, for example, measure the same characteristic? And it, its internal structure. Perhaps that has subscales within it. You might be looking at that for an analytic uh, methods to have a look at that. And test retest. We'll come back to the issue there, of that later. You want to know whether what you're measuring is stable over time. Um, now, reliability constrains validity. Validity is, is how accurate is your measure. So if your reliability is not high enough, um, it is not impossible to get a valid measure. But valid, the validity can be in terms of the, the construct. If you've got a gold standard, you can measure it against that. Or predictive. If you can be looking to see whether a person's in a particular um, group or whether it's actually predicting some characteristic of them over time. Um, in terms of wider prediction things, in terms of uh, treatment studies, for example, you might be asking who's benefiting uh, from the study. So looking at prediction from characteristics of baseline or mechanisms of effect, looking at moderation, that is, do particular characteristics change the outcomes? Maybe men do better in this treatment than women or vice versa. A mediation, what is the process by which it goes through? What do you, how, is there something which is actually making it um, happen later, that outcome that you're after? So for example, with our work, we're interested in, in, in the uh, uh, involvement in imagery and craving. So does the change in imagery and craving predict whether the person is using more of this alcohol? And you might then be looking at assessment of an intervention, and the rest of what I'll talk about is really going to be on that. So how can you, how can you look at whether a, uh, an intervention is working? Well, to start out with, you might try it out with, say, one person, right, and just see whether there's any difference. So they're depressed, and then they become less depressed after your, after your intervention. That's a typical clinical case study. Okay? And you might do multiple ones of these. Um, and in, in, in terms of um, you know, working, say, with a clinical health service, they don't want to do a randomised controlled trial. They just want you to say, you know, are people getting better as a result of what's happening in this particular um, uh, setting? 
Um, unfortunately, of course, we don't know what's going on, whether people have gotten better anyway, um, so-called spontaneous recovery. Um, it always sounds to me like phlogiston, but you know, I don't think there's anything spontaneous about it. Um, pe people actually sometimes do a lot of work to actually get better by themselves. Um, so would they have gotten better anyway? Um, was it this particular treatment, or you know, could it have been another one that could have worked just as well? So we need something to give a bit more control. But it's still a good way to start out. So this is this is some pilot data we collected last year. We just collected some more pilot data on on our uh, functional imagery training intervention with alcohol. Um, so last year we just did an uncontrolled uh, set of 12 cases, looking to see whether in fact we were getting um, an impact from the intervention and, and how large that effect size was. And then we we're comparing that just with the effect size in our last trial and using that as order to be able to make an argument to get funding for a randomised control trial. Yeah. So we don't know whether that produced the effect, but we can say that we're getting an effect there, so it's worthwhile going to the next step. So what can you do? Well, if you're working in a clinical setting and you want to know whether what you're doing is making an effect, but you've got, you've got only one case, because it's really quite a special case and it's different from all the other ones that might be coming through, what can you do with that? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, and, and there is a behavioural tradition in particular that has been looking at this. So one thing that you could do would be, let's say that you've got a particular treatment, which is going to say, you know, you, you look, you're looking at whether a, a child pays attention in the classroom. Then you could give them some form of reward for a while um, and see whether that changes the degree of attention. And then withdraw that reward, see whether that makes a difference, and then reinstate the reward. And that's a reversal design where you're looking to see whether you're changing that over time. Okay? Or perhaps you could say, well, I'm, I'm going to actually look progressively at things that they're doing in the classroom. So I'll, I'll look progressively at attention and then at talking to, the, to their neighbour or you know, something else and see whether when I reward one thing, does that change but the other things can remain the same and then progressively move on. Or you could do it across children as well and reward Jim, then David, then Mary and see whether, in fact, the multiple baselines are going along underneath that, whether they're progressively changing. You all get the idea? OK. That's a reasonable idea. Difficulty is that typically it's hard to get lots of those. So you're making a judgment based sometimes on only one or two of these, these changes. You know, and statistically, you know, you're just really just looking at graphs, aren't you? You're not really making any statistical inference from that. But the other thing that's really quite important is these don't work unless you've got a problem with your treatment, which I think is quite ironic because you're trying to actually test the treatment. So think about it for a minute. That reversal design only works if you've got no maintenance in your treatment. It only works while the treatment's in place. As soon as you take the treatment away, it immediately goes back. And that's not what you want. You want to actually create a lasting change, don't you? And, and the multiple baseline, that only works if you've got no generalisation. So, you know, you, you could work on this particular specific thing, but it's not going to change the other things that might be going on or the other children in the classroom, whatever it is. So each of those is, a, is, is problematic in terms of your, your intervention. I think it's important to remember that because sometimes people think that these are solutions. And really, a lot of the time they're not. Like, I've done an attempt at a reversal, well, and the treatment was too good. It just didn't bounce back. So you can't, it just then becomes like a single case. Okay, so... Now I'm going to focus down even more um, and talk about randomised control trials and the rest of what I talk about will just be on that. So let's have a look at randomised control trials, sometimes called efficacy trials. Um, lots of different versions of these. Um, so you could be comparing a particular intervention against no treatment, at least that, that controls against so-called spontaneous recovery. Right? Or you could do a, a control where you're comparing what you're doing with what people usually do, whatever that might be. And you know, a lot of the trials that are done are like that. So if you're going in, for example, to an inpatient unit and you're giving them a new treatment for um, comorbid use of cannabis, um, they're going to get lots of treatment in the inpatient unit for their psychosis and whatever else, lots of counselling and stuff. You can try to document that as best you can, but we're going to be giving something on top of that and seeing whatever we do on top of that works. Sometimes it's really hard to know exactly what it is that they did. And if they're very good at it, you may not be able to show that what you're doing is any better. 
So it's a bit of a risk there. Like we went in there thinking they probably won't be doing anything about substance use, and we were right. Um, so we were able to show an effect. But what if they'd been successful? You know, what if they had been doing something sensible? We wouldn't have been able to detect it. So a bit of a risk going in there. You've got to know what it is they're doing in parallel. A version of this is a weightless approach, where you might either with the no treatment or with the standard treatment be uh, giving one group an intervention immediately and then uh, uh, then give it to the second group. And some of the trials are doing the on functional inventory training are like that. Um, and the advantage of that is you don't just get to see it once, you get to replicate the effect. And I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. So you can it, don't neglect that by the way. Some people don't test it, don't test the delayed group to see whether it worked as well. For heaven's sake, you use a delayed treatment design, test the second group because it replicates the first effect. Yeah? Um, and more commonly though, you're using some kind of comparison treatment. Either the treatment of people that's most common or accepted at the moment, um, or some kind of um, uh, contrast in theory that you're trying to examine. Um, one of the things about the accepted treatment that I think is quite important is that if you're, if you're testing a new treatment against something that is really well accepted in the field, it isn't always necessary to show that what you, you've got is better. You've got to show us at least it's good. And in fact, that's what a lot of pharmacotherapy trials do. So there's lots of antidepressants out there. They're virtually the same as each other. And if the companies don't kind of care about that. They make, their, they make their marketing on lower side effects or something like that. Um, they're quite happy if they, you know, they prefer it, it's better, but they'll go out there and market it like crazy if it's just the same. You know, I think we ought to be learning from that, that in fact, you know, it's okay for us to do that too on, on occasion. So perhaps our treatment is as good, but it's cheaper to give. Um, fewer sessions, or maybe it's, it's um, we're able to get the same effect, but uh, get it out there better. So for example, we've just found with that, with that second trial, I showed you the pilot before, we, we did that was face to face, a couple of sessions, um, about um, three and a half hours total uh, contact time that people got in the first three months. We've just replicated that where it's all by phone, so it's more accessible, and it's only it's only a bit over two hours. But that's an advantage to show that you can do the same thing with less time. Yeah. Um, okay, and then then there's effectiveness. Once you've shown that within controlled conditions, what you're doing seems to work. Um, it seems to be better than, or at least as good as some of the other things. Um, the next question is, so does it make a difference in routine practice? And chances are you won't get the same strength of effects. Um, now this is important when you're reading the literature because most of the trials that you see are actually efficacy trials. Uh, the important thing is that when you get a regular clinician, it doesn't necessarily do it you know, to the gold standard that you've got in your efficacy trial. Does it still work? And with almost everything, and even pharmacotherapy, it doesn't work as well typically in that context. So it's important to understand that when you go to the doctor for the antidepressant, you may not actually be getting, you may not be giving the right dose to you, might be not giving you the right advice on when to take it or how long to take it and so on. So, um, it, it's usually not quite as effective as it is when you're using it in the efficacy trial. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I don't do psychology, but I was, um, a lot of psychological tests can have like placebo <coughs> as a control. Yeah. Because it could be an intervention, just be that someone is talking to somebody's nice. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean the content is happening, it could just be talking. So, how, how do you sort of test against that? Well, the equivalent in a psychological context is we, we, we try to get things that are similar to that. Yeah. Um, the difficulty is getting something which people will believe as much as they believe a placebo. So if you're giving somebody, you know, two white tablets, one of them happens, one of them happens to be the drug, and the other one looks exactly the same, but it's the placebo, it's just a sugar pill, um, then that's quite powerful, um, a, a quite powerful control. But in, in psychology, if we're doing something else like, you know, sometimes people have done, for example, against a full CBT, typical relaxation. But the people going in there know that they're getting relaxation, it doesn't seem as kind of less believable. Yeah. So um, it, it isn't as strong. What, one of the things that has turned out sometimes to be surprisingly powerful as a kind of placebo treatment, I don't think it is actually a true placebo, is, uh, well, not as relaxation actually, kind of thing, it does have active effects. Um, but 
uh, one of the things people have, have been looking at is befriending. Yeah. And um, there's some really interesting trials. So, for example, they've, they've been looking at people with pre-psychotic kind of phenomena and doing a full CBT to help people to test those, the accuracy of those, and reduce their distress and so on. Really good interventions. They compared that with just being a nice person and talking yeah. to them about the things that they like to do and so on. They're just as good as each other. The spirit, really. <laughs> but they are. So, yeah, that's important, and I should have put that in there. And then, of course, you might be looking at cost effectiveness. Um, and um, if we get time later, I'll, I'll show you a, a bit of an application that we're putting into the funding at the moment, which has got a cost effectiveness component. One of the difficulties there is what costs do you put in, and, and how do you measure effectiveness? <coughs> Um, actually, it's a broader issue, how you measure effectiveness, because um, uh, let me talk about that in another context, just with the RCTs for a minute. One of the things with a lot of the, the medication trials, and the psychological trials too sometimes, um, with, um, with a whole lot of areas, um, psychosis, depression, alcohol misuse, is that they focus on a particular outcome. So, um, with psychosis, you'll, you'll see that the drug trials, if you read them, they're focusing on the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, hallucinations, delusions, and so on, um, and, or the negative symptoms, so uh, lack of affect, lack of motivation, things like that. What they often don't test is the quality of life of the person. Um, and it turns out that the medication is actually quite good at changing the symptoms, particularly positive symptoms has almost no impact on the quality of life. So there's people out there who are getting treated with pharmacotherapy and the, you know, saying, you know, they would trumpet this out at the conference and say this, this is a success. The person's having a miserable life. You know, really lacking in, in, in the kind of nice things that we experience and, and, and balance our lives every day. Uh, many people never get cuddled and so on. You know, they, they just don't have that kind of, that kind of uh, existence. The same with alcohol misuse. You, know, you can see that, that you know, people might be reducing their drinking, but is their life actually in the So that, that's important. It, it really comes up here, but it comes up more generally. Um, but in terms of costs, what costs are you going to put in? Well, sometimes they look at, you know, how much does it cost for the actual treatment to be given? So we, we, we look at all of the costs attached to the going to sessions, the salaries that we're paying, and so on. Sometimes even the infrastructure, the building, things like that get put in. But what about the costs that the person is saving because they're getting better. So, so do we look at um, lost days at work? Well, some studies do. What if they're going to work, but they're really ineffective at work, so-called presenteeism? We measure that and what that costs. And that's getting a bit harder. How do I know the extent to which my productivity is not so great today? Is it because I had too much to drink last night? Or is it because I had a fight with my wife this morning? Or is it because I'm feeling depressed? You know, it's going to be hard for the person to know why it is that, 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 that that's occurring. So that, that's a bit iffy. Um, how do we put a, a costing on, on, the, on the, what the family's doing? So they're having to take the person to treatment, or they're having to actually look after them in their house. Um, maybe they can't go to work. So it's a whole, it gets really complicated. The more you go into this, and sometimes the costs are somewhat notional. So people have suggested what, what something might be worth. Um, so look at those studies with, with some scepticism. Look very carefully at what it is that they put into their equations. Um, because often there's some really quite strong assumptions that they're making in terms of both, both sides of the equation. Okay, so let's focus on RCTs. Um, and what I'm going to do is go through some potential traps. Um, and then I'm going to go through some catch-22s, if you like, some binds. Okay? And then we'll look at some potential things. So let's look at some traps. Some of them are obvious, and I apologise beforehand to those of you who know this area. Some of them less obvious. Well, one of them is some sampling issues. Um, lack of representativeness is an issue uh, in, in terms of you're always actually confined by where you're getting people from. If you're getting people from the Plymouth students, is that the same as the Exeter students, the London students, the Glasgow students? So where you're getting them from is important. But also, are they representative of the group that you think that they're representative of? So you manage to get you manage to get people who maybe use emails. Uh, you get people who are looking on the web. 
um, you, you're, getting, you're getting the people who catch that particular bus. You need to be thinking about how you got the people and, and how they're likely to have heard about it. Um, and, and potential correlations in there. So, you know, if, if you say to somebody, look, um, I'm really short of people for this study, you know, can you just let other people know that um, the study's on? Um, they'll tell their friends, right? And maybe their friends are like them. So you may not actually have a group of people that's the same as everyone else. Now you can try to test for that. You can say, look, my sample has the same age, gender, socioeconomic mix as all of the Puma students. That doesn't necessarily answer the question. You don't necessarily know whether they're representative on the key issues that you're actually looking at. You may not have picked the right variables there to check. Um, and sometimes it, it's, it's, it's unavoidable. And we were doing a study on, um, on trying to work with general practitioners to get them to see um, depression as a chronic recurring disorder rather than just episodic sort of depression. Um, and we're encouraging them also to think about comorbidities. And we were working with general practitioners in, in rural Queensland, which is a very big state. And we, we, what we did was we said, Look, we're going to go further than that. We're going to actually have um, five towns that we worked with initially to do a whole lot of training of the GPs, and then five towns that we, we do that after a year. Okay? Look, really, your N is only five there. You can be testing lots of people in those, but you know, effectively, you've got a whole lot of correlation in there. If you are going to use the patient coming into the surgery as the unit of analysis, um, then, then what you've got to do is account for the correlation there. Um, and you can do that statistically, but sometimes, sometimes it's a bit of guesswork in, in, involved in that process. Okay. Um, in a clinical study, do we, do we want to go for people with a particular disorder or do we want to think more broadly? You know, working with, with alcohol, for example. Um, do we want to say that they have to fulfill the criteria for alcohol use disorder? That's useful if I'm actually going to be talking to some other people in the field who actually think that's important. Um, so if I'm trying to get it published in a psychiatry journal in the United States, for example, that's a good idea if I'm using a diagnostic and statistical manual of, that's used in the US, right? Okay, um, the question is though, what I'm doing then is I'm relying on the validity of that. And it's not perfectly valid. I mean, all of those classifications are really just, I think of them as, think of them as ways of dividing the stars up in constellations. You could divide them up that way, divide them up that way. Lots of different ways that you could see it. And hey, what do you know? They just changed it. <laughs> Dramatically changed it. So now what do we do? I mean, they keep on doing this. If you look back, look back at some of the 1950s articles on, on psychosis. In those days, there was a huge difference between who got schizophrenia diagnosis in England and who got it in the United States because the criteria was so different. Actually, it's quite interesting because homosexuality, for example. Yeah, exactly. Now it's not in there, obviously. There wasn't PTSD at all, so most of the PTSD patients were divided between different. Yeah, they were. Yeah. So there are there are issues with doing that. And and besides which, sometimes it's not that's not the issue. So in a lot of our studies more recently, what we've been doing is not looking at people. Yes, we do ask, we do test to see whether they fulfill the criteria for disorder, because it's useful in telling people, you know, about our study. But in, actually we just want people who are drinking a lot and it's causing them a problem. Isn't that, isn't that what we're after? <laughs> yeah? So, you know, it's a much more important question, I think, to be doing that than it is to be... It turns out, you know, over 90% of them do have a disorder, but that's not the point. You know, we, we're testing it in terms of that particular issue. Now, participant loss is an issue. It's a really difficult one. Um, the fact that you want them to keep on coming doesn't mean they, they do want to keep coming to see you. Um, so it really is difficult. We'll come back later to the fact that it's really hard to analyse as well. Um, but let's look at what you can do to try to keep people. And, and if you're going to do any study with repeated, repeated assessments, I don't care what field it is, 
these things can help. First of all, try to find at least three or four ways of contacting them. Now, if you're working with people with mobile phones, they change their number. You're working with people with emails, so they change their email address. So if you try to make sure you've got an email address, you've got their mobile phone number, you can get their street address, see if you can get somebody else who they don't mind if you call, to get in touch with them, do whatever you can, right? So make sure you've got at least four, right, what I recommend. The second thing is, you've got to be assertive. Now we've been looking at some, um, oh God, think about one study that we did. Um, the very first study we did on comorbidity with you know, substance use and people with psychosis, we had one person who moved to Adelaide. We had to phone every hostel in Adelaide, I don't know how many there were, about 50 I think, before we found that person. you just got to keep at it. Um, I had a person who I was treating, um, she, she was nice enough with me, she seemed to be really keen to do it, but I couldn't get hold of her. Kept on calling and calling. I think we must have tried 20 times to call her before we finally got hold of her. Uh, you've got to be really assertive. Um, I did a study with, um, with a, a student who was looking at um, a gambling study. It was an online gambling, um, not online gambling, it was an online treatment for gambling. Um, and we were looking at how, how we could actually stop people from dropping out or um, actually intervening quickly. We, we found that. In fact, you've only got a few days, at the most. Once the person's really decided to drop out, forget it. You won't convince them to come back in for, for any reason. So you, you've got to get it while they're wavering. So you've got, to, you've got to have a really good system for knowing the date on which this person is due for the next assessment. If they don't respond, get back to them quickly. Okay, and keep on that at that point. If you leave it for even a week, Usually that's too late. So that's a really important point, I think. Um, and lastly, I am. <laughs> so we, we, we're taking up from you know, you know, United States practice. We didn't used to do that. There's this committee used to not like us doing that, but now we're happy for us to do it. And what we do is actually have a rising scale. So you might get, um, you know, you might get 10 pounds for the first follow-up. 15 pounds for the second one, 20 pounds for the third one, you get them all, you get another 20. Yeah? That's the way to get it. Um, you need to report it. I'll show you how to do this in a minute. It's called the consult diagram. And when you analyze, you really need to be analyzing by intent to treat. That is, once they are eligible, they're in the study, and you try to analyze for them, regardless of how much intervention they have. But they might have come to no sessions at all, they're still in the study. They're still in the analysis. Tough, I know. You can do secondary analysis of completers, but the ones that the journal is going to be interested in are intention to treat. So what's the consult diagram? Well, here's a real one from a study that we did. Um, this was a study on um, depression and alcohol. Um, there were four, um, four intervention arms, so a brief one, um, depression only, alcohol only, and both depression and alcohol. Um, 682 people were re uh, referred and screened. We excluded 398. Um, some were eligible, um, 149 refused, 45 couldn't contact. We randomised 284, 70, 71, 68, 75. By the time we got to post, we only had 61, 63, 51, 63. So you report on all of that, um, and, you, and that's standard, you must do that. If you're doing any kind of intervention trial, that's what you must have. There's a new one called Spirit. Same sort of idea, but they have extra criteria for what you think you're um, reporting as just part of it. Okay, um, some more traps, randomization. Um, I was doing a study with some people in another city. Um, oh, it's really hard doing on site trials, especially when people are, are not really well versed in experimental procedure. We're having difficulty in getting um, the right number of people coming through it. And they were saying, well, they didn't seem to be the right people for that for that particular one, so I thought I'd put them in the other image. It's <laughs> not random. <laughs> no, it was random. I just took the next one out of the pile. It was that. What do you do? Um, we were trying to do a, a study uh, it, with, um, uh, with people in, in clinical context. Um, we were looking at um, family treatment schizophrenia, and we were doing the um, family intervention or an individual intervention with the same treatment components. 
why aren't you referring to that? Oh, well, the next one was a family one, and I, I really thought this person needed the individual one, or vice versa. <laughs> so, what you've got to do is make sure that they, they don't know about what condition they're going into when they're making the decision that they're eligible. Okay, it's only after that point, only after that point that the person knows. And even though we're not, even though we're going to play by the book, you still have to do it that way within your team. Okay? Um, and the allocation is to be independent. So that you can say, look, I didn't do it. Um, what we're doing now is that it's actually um, it, it's actually automated. So we've got a computer program that does it for us. But you know, sometimes there, there now are randomized con controlled trials centers that have been set up to do this kind of thing for people. Um, so independent. But but maybe you can still guess. So you know, if, if it was if it was alternating, for example, you say, well, last one was family intervention. This one must be individual one. I don't want them to go in that. So I'll just say, uh, I don't think they're eligible. Okay. Well, um, one of the ways of dealing with this is to instead of using just random numbers, to use random permutations and to use different random permutations. So, for example, if we've got three conditions, we might use random permutations of one to three and random permutations of one to six. And we randomize that. So it's really hard to guess which one it is um, that the person is going into. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, you still can get baseline differences though, and they're at times hard to interpret. Here's, here's one with, with one of our early uh, functional imagery training trials. There's only 10 people in each of these. So this difference is not significant. But this is the only group that's actually getting a significant difference over this period. It doesn't look like they're much different up here though. It looks like most of the difference that we're seeing is down here. So even though that might not be statistically significant, to what extent is the fact that it's down there causing the, the fact that this is looking better? You know, it's an issue. It keeps on coming up in different contexts. Here's one where it was significant. Um, this was, and, and this is interesting, this is one of those ones where you can actually see a replication too. Um, so this was a study, a correspondence-based treatment. So we sent people a series of letters for their alcohol misuse, and we had several conditions. This one got the intervention letters first. Um, these ones had self-monitoring just until there, and then they got the intervention. Nice. Um, these ones were a wait list, they got nothing in here. Sorry, these ones were self-monitoring, I said. These ones got nothing at all, then they got the full intervention. They're looking the same, that's nice. And this one didn't get the intervention until over here. And then it, it got better as well. Okay. Oh, that's all very nice, except, gosh, that's a bit inconvenient that they're starting at a bit lower than the rest. And in fact, this difference here was significant. And there's large numbers in that. I, mean, I think there was 140, 850 people in that trial. So that's fairly substantial. You'd think just by randomization, you wouldn't have had that happen. But it did. Um, so what do we do about it? Well, you try to prevent that happening, I'll show you how in a minute. Um, but in this one, what we had to do was to, um, was to uh, oh, by the way, don't, a lot of people would say, look, just um, do an analysis of covariance, so covariance for the baseline. The problem with covariance is that essentially you're just looking for a main effect. There might be an interaction effect. So it may be that, in fact, um, this group does better if it's higher than the other groups do. Yeah? So you're not actually analysing for that interaction if you do that. What, what we did was that we created um, bands. So you know, in terms of the alcohol usage, we, crea we created a variable based on those bands, and we actually analysed for that in the, in the data. So we're looking to see whether there were any inter interactions with the, with the treatment group. And there's other ways of doing it. That, probably you know about and, and suggest to me that would have been better. That's what we did in the study. So, but it's better still if you stratify the randomization in the first place. So if you, for example, um, if you like, you have some people that might be really very high in your alcohol misuse, why don't you have separate randomization of those people? So you know roughly what that's going to be beforehand. Um, so you could actually have separate randomization of high and low. Um, in the beginning, that, help, that helps to take it away. Okay. 
What about measurement? <coughs> well, you know, so, a lot of the measures that you see, even now, um, in people's studies have either poor um, or unknown reliability and validity. Um, many of them are idiosyncratic measures that the person uses and it just happens that their group uses them, nobody else in the world uses them. Creates a bit of a problem for meta-analysis. You can, you can attempt to look at um, the, these different measures in terms of meta-analysis by looking at you know, um, uh, creating um, scores based on their standard deviations, but I mean, it's not very satisfactory. You're mixing apples and pears and so on. It's better if we're all using similar measures um, to be able to be able to be able to combine data later. And in fact, now um, increasingly in the clinical area, there's growing up a, a, um, a requirement that we actually deposit data. And, and people are now looking at doing mega trials. So, you know, if you've got multiple trials that are using a cognitive behavioural therapy and they're all using the same measure, um, and they're all using uh, good randomization, we can actually look at a, a, a mega analysis across thousands of people, you know, and be able then to get a much better idea about what effect sizes there are and how strong those, um, those interventions are. So, um, it's good if it's not idiosyncratic. And the only problem is, you know, I've got the best one and nobody else understands that. Um, with a sensor observation, sometimes the definitions of the behaviour aren't clear enough. Has anybody here done, done uh, observer uh, work with, you know, it's actually really difficult to get clear definitions of a behaviour, even a very simple one, like, you know, paying attention in class. Um, it's, it's actually remarkably difficult to get those definitions right. Um, and we also need to make sure that we're all on the same wavelength about what we mean by those definitions, and that we do some, some examples, and we all agree, yes, that is the behaviour, or that isn't the behaviour. Unfortunately, though, we get a bit of case law over time, and you know, after you've done 50 of these, you think that's inattention, but you know, you didn't rate it as inattention in the first time you did it. You get so-called observer drift. So it's important to see whether you're actually still the same as you were at the beginning. Um, and of course, as, uh, as as observers, we're not without bias. We we actually have some hypotheses going into this study. We might find particular things. So are we, are we going to be more likely to see it as the inattention if they're in the control group than they're in the experimental group? Would be? Uh, so ideally we want the assessor to be blind to condition. So if you're doing a, a diagnostic interview, for example, or you, you, you're doing an interview on the phone to see how depressed the person, are, uh, person is, it, it might be a good idea if that person is making that phone call or doing that interview doesn't know whether they are in the in the treatment or control room. Uh, what about self-report? Well, you know, people do want to present themselves. They want to present themselves well. They want to present themselves as being a good participant. They they're really pleased that you spent time with them and you tried to help them. So they want to sort of say, "Yeah, well, I'm better. I guess you know, quite as bad as I was before." Um, but it's even more subtle than that, because here they know they're lying, kind of. Um, but here, what about if they think that they're in a, a, the intervention that's going to work, or they think that they're not? Look, if you're in the, if you're in the group that know, you know that you're waiting for your intervention, you don't think you're going to get better, do you? It's like a reverse expectancy, isn't it? It's going to be depressing your score. Even if you are feeling a bit better, it's not, not really, because I'm still waiting. Yeah? and you're in the intervention, you think you're getting better. So uh, ideally we want to make the person themselves blind, but that's a bit hard, because you know, you know, what, you know what psychological intervention you had, and because of the ethical constraints, you often have to tell them what the alternative was. So it's kind of hard to make them double blind. So all we can sometimes do is test to see whether there's an effect uh, of expectancy, and I'll come back to that later, because it turns out not to be as straightforward as you might think. What about retrospectivity? One of the difficulties is that when we're trying to remember something, um, we, we have biased recollection of that. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're trying to remember, for if I ask you, for example, try to remember what you had for breakfast the Monday before last. It's kind of hard to do that. 
So if you are trying to give me some kind of an answer, what are you going to use? Well, you're going to use what you usually do, okay? And that might be based on whether you think you're on a diet or whether you think you're probably someone who doesn't really adhere to a diet. So it's going to depend upon your view of yourself as well. And it's going to depend on what's salient. So it, it might be that, um, you know, if I ask you how much you usually drink, for example, if, if you have had a few nights when you've been pretty heavy on the drink, maybe that will influence what you say you usually drink. And besides which, people are lousy at doing averaging. If you ask people to, to, that question, how much do you usually, it's a terrible question. Because people can't do that task accurately. Because um, we don't have this kind of computer in our brain that does the sums. We don't do it that way. Um, so, one of the things that we can do is to, is to use that effect of salience to our advantage. So one of the things we could do is to say, well, okay, I want you to try to remember what you, what you had to drink last Sunday. Can you think about what you did last Sunday? Just tell me all the things that happened. Was there anything out of the ordinary? Were you with anybody? Yeah? You doing that now? Okay, now think with those events. Did you have anything to drink? And, and now it comes back to you. And in fact, you can do this reasonably accurately for as long as a month on alcohol. Um, if you really spend some time on it. And really it's just a diarised thing where you're trying to think back on what you did and then think about um, what, what your behaviour was. It's, it's easier with, a, with, with things that are not too frequent than with really frequent. Well, you wouldn't do this with smoking, right? Because there's just too many of them. It's too hard to do this way. So you've got to do that in another way and you've got to think, use the same technique <coughs> but do it to get people to think about when they bought the cigarettes and how much they bought. Because right? that's going to give you a pretty good idea of how much they smoke. Okay, what about the intervention then? Um, well, one of the issues is that the therapist didn't do what they were supposed to or did it in a way that you couldn't replicate it if somebody else tried to do it. So what can you do about that? Well, you must manualise what you're doing and it really has to be down to what you see the next kind of thing, if you possibly can. Sometimes you can't do it that well. You have to do it in terms of the components. But it has to be sufficient that somebody else would come in and do that again, like you. Just as we said before about um, the, the observation, you've got to train the person until they've got good fidelity. That's a lot of hard work. It takes a long time to do that properly. And it's, you're tempting to say, oh, that's probably good enough. Good enough really doesn't really work in this context. It won't, it won't give you the effects that you're after. You need to have good queuing. Actually, what we're doing at the moment, um, we've, got, we've got an issue in Australia that, particularly in remote communities, um, it's difficult to get good health services out to them, and they're still very traditional. Um, they, there's, there's a lot of... Um, uh, there's a lot of indigenous medicine out there and indigenous healers. Um, and what we've been trying to do is engage those indigenous healers in doing Western medicine as well, um, because that's the best way of getting people engaged in, in their healthcare. Right? Does that make sense? Now, the problem is those people, they haven't been to university, they, they, they have very limited skills. So, how do you actually get them to do something which is going to work, um, given their sort of lack of understanding of our whole worldview, let alone um, let alone the specific procedures. So what we've been doing is we, we're working on an app at the moment. We just finished a, a, an app which actually leads the, the, uh, the Indigenous health worker through some steps um, that will help them to get the person to think about issues that are around their well-being and then set some simple goals about what they're going to do. Um, and that intervention was first of all trialled in a face-to-face -face format um, in, in an island off the top of Australia um, um, by a colleague of mine who works in Darwin. And, and now we're adapting because we know that, that we know it's culturally appropriate. Um, and you know she developed a, a, a paper format of that to help people use it. Now we're now we're taking it across to a, to an iPad format and using that. And it's working really well. I mean, we haven't got outcome data on it yet, but it appears to 
people are, are saying that it really makes sense to them and they can use that effectively. So what we're doing is giving them step-by-step -step cues about how to take the person through this very simple intervention. Okay? Um, and then it's really important that you check the fidelity. Um, so if you're getting people to give uh, treatment sessions, you need to record them, you need somebody to look at them, it's, you know, it's a pain but you've got to do it. The other thing that we get people to do is we give them a checklist to make sure that they are actually, it helps them actually remember what the steps are that they're going to do and they, they can actually tick off that yes, I did that step. Um, but but Folos Powers eliminate the therapist altogether. So we're, we've now been doing some work on, on web-based interventions that don't need a therapist at all. So really they're, they're, um, uh, they're, they're just assistance for self um, self-management of the problem, if you like, but they are using all of the same strategies that we would use in a face-to-face -face treatment. Now, interestingly, there's now a lot of trials on this work, and it shows that it's about as effective as a therapist is a little worried, isn't it? Um, and it, 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 it actually is, is slightly more effective if you do have a therapist coach but it turns out that the administrative staff in the clinic do just as well as the psychologists at being a coach. So it really requires somebody who is helping the person to stay, to be, help encourage them to keep trying at it, is it, encourage them to actually engage with web treatment. They don't need to have specialist knowledge on top of that. Yeah, that's um, Yeah, it's really quite dramatic that we're getting roughly the same effects as you get from face to face treatment. Okay, some more traps. Um, well, it's not just the therapist side, it's also the participant. Like, that wet treatment's all very well, but um, people don't finish it. <laughs> and that's where the coach is really useful, right? They, they, they stop that way. So um, there is a question there of whether they're right, of course. Sometimes they, and, and in general, when people drop out of treatment, sometimes they're right. Sometimes they have had enough, they don't need to come back anymore. Sometimes it's holding them back, indeed, from going to the next level in their life. So sometimes they're right about that, but often they're not. So um, in, in, our, uh, in our trial of, of alcohol and depression treatment by the web, um, what we found was that um, the more times they logged in, the worse they did. But that's part because some of them are logging in and checking how badly they were going. But the more of the program they did, the better they did. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so sometimes they don't come. Um, work on their initial motivation. Try to, to see if you've got that, they're really engaged in being in the treatment. The assertive follow up here for the treatment as well as for the, for the assessment <coughs> I was telling you about before. Some of us don't hear it correctly or they don't recall it correctly. Doctors will often say, you know, but I told them about the risks of the operation beforehand. Maybe they did sometimes, but the person was so upset about being told they're about to have an operation for cancer, they didn't hear anything else in the rest of the interview. They're too busy processing that information. Um, even if they did hear it, they don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily encode that and record, recall it. But one of the things you can do is to, is to get them to rehearse that or um, ideally get them to write down a summary or give you back a summary so they're generating it and it helps to reinforce the memory. Um, but in, in therapy it's often really helpful to have them have an audio recording and actually listen to that again because often they pick up things um, that they missed in the session itself because they're too busy processing the last bit and, and kind of miss things often. They'll often come back to you and say, that's fantastic, I didn't realise that any of that stuff until I heard the recording. Now, unfortunately, you know, they don't just do what you're wanting them to do. They often do things by themselves. My very first trial was a trial on CBT for depression and the wait list. The wait list did just as well. And we asked them later, and they said, well, you weren't going to give it to me, so I went and got it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it is a problem. You can't control. You know, doing a web treatment, yes, I might be giving them web stuff, but they're also looking at 15 other programs at the same time. You can't stop them doing it, all you can do is ask them if they did it and hope they're telling you the truth. 
um, and analyze for it if you need to. This is all interesting. I hope you're taking something away from it, um, even if it's only to be skeptical when you go to the doctor. <laughs> okay, um, what about some binds? Um, so let's go through some of the catch 22s. Um, Okay, you want to equalise the treatment contact because you know the number of times that you saw the person or the number of hours that you saw them, maybe that in itself is important. We talked about you know just being a nice person before might have an effect. So equalising contact, but equalising what contact? Let's have a look at this example. This is a study that I did on um, CBT um, plus a kind of Q exposure. And what we did was we got them to have a couple of drinks. And then we put the drink, it had to be their favourite drink, of course, um, in front of them. They had to look at it, they had to pick it up, they had to sniff it, but not drink it. 45 minutes. Okay? Alright. Um, and But we, we knew that kind of worked. We've done previous work on that before. But this was a kind of a different context, because these were people who had a real problem drinking when they were unhappy, and they were pretty unhappy. Okay? So after the first few sessions, in this last condition, um, we made them unhappy first, and then said, no, no drink. Okay? How do we do that? Well, it's very easy. Just get them to think about a time they've been sad in the past, and girlfriend left them, person, you know, pet died, something like that. You, I could make all of you feel unhappy for five or ten minutes, and I don't want to do that right now, but it's relatively easy to do that. So we got, them, we got them unhappy, that kind of work. One of, one of the difficulties was that somebody who comes to a study who um, is, um, oh, an habituation did, did occur. Um, so you do get habituation of the craving during the study itself, session itself. But one of the things about people who are dysphoric is they don't want to come to a session where they're going to be made unhappy. <coughs> so they stayed away in droves in that, in that last condition. And didn't matter what we did to try to keep them in, we couldn't get them to keep coming back to the same extent. Um, and we had absolutely no difference between the conditions. They all got better, but they all got better to about the same extent. Okay? Now, one of the things here is, um, did we equalise the right thing? So think about this. If you're... I thought I had another slide in there. Uh, if, if you're saying well, you have to have eight sessions, and one condition has cognitive behaviour therapy, and the other conditions have cognitive behaviour therapy plus some cure exposure. The people who have in that second case, they're getting less CBT. So if you are going to be equalising for the total contact, you're not equalising for the amount of cognitive behaviour therapy. Okay? And that could be one of the reasons why it didn't work. Okay, um, what about sampling? Well, one of the things when you're sampling is that you, you probably want to be defining your samples so that you don't have things that are really going to be proving to be a problem for you. So, um, perhaps, for example, in a, in a study on depression, you say, look, for this study, thank you, I don't want to have... It will be easy. We'll be over that quickly. Um, for that study, I don't want to have people who are currently psychotic. We need to have some control here. So you have this difficulty that, that okay, you've got control by excluding those people, but people in the field say to you, but that study is irrelevant to me because, you know, you've got these people who are really closely defined. I have to look at 100 people coming in my door before I find one of them, the like the person that was in your study. Because people come in with all kinds of problems, you know, and you've refined it, you control it to an extent that it means nothing for me. Right? So you, you have this issue of how far do you go with control. The more control you get, the less realistic it is. And with the, the measures, do we go for standard ones to help with the meta-analysis? Well, increasingly we're, we're being pushed in that direction. But what if the standard measures are pretty awful? Uh, we've been looking, for example, at measures of craving. And most of the measures of craving are not testing that at all. They're testing all kinds of stuff. They're testing intentions, self-efficacy, all kinds of things that are not about craving. They say, look, if you're making us go and get those, those measures, they're not the right ones. So there is a problem that it actually holds the field back. It's a very conservative way of dealing with this problem. So we're going to be improving things 
that's going to be setting things in cement. Problematic. Do we go for a state measure or a trade measure? You would think, look, if I'm going to be looking at changing, say, people's depression or anxiety, don't I want to look at a state measure, not at whether they are a, an anxious person? You know, am I really going to change them from being an anxious person? The difficulty here is, if I say, how anxious are you right now? Okay. And I ask you tomorrow, how anxious are you right now? You might not be anxious at all tomorrow, but you were very anxious today because there was an exam or something, you know, you're trying to get something finished. So the state measure is going to be bouncing all over the place. If you're looking at the degree of test retest reliability, the state measure is going to be around about 0.3 for anxiety. The trait measure is going to be about 0.6, 0.65. Ironically, if you are going to be testing whether the person changes on their anxiety, you've got to use the measure that says how do you generally feel, <coughs> because that has put better reliability. One of those things. So you, you want, want to make sure that the measure isn't too good at burning a trade. It's got to allow some change, but it can't be a big mistake because it won't work. You won't be able to detect it. You'll, you'll be getting too much error in your, in your data. The standard deviation is going to be too small with the of groups, too large with the of groups. What about expectancies? Well, yeah, I said we could test for them. But okay, all right, you're coming into the study and I'm going to give you two, two um, treatments. And one of them is um, gobbledygook treatment and the other one is blue cheese treatment. Yeah, so, um, yeah, right, I think they sound about the same to me. It, they don't know what it is that they're asked, being asked for about their expectancies at that point. So, do you then ask them a couple of sessions in when they do know what their what their um, uh, particular treatment is? How you know how how likely do you think it is now that you're going to get better with this treatment? And what percent of people would actually you know improve? And how strongly would you be advising somebody to do this treatment? Those sort of questions, right? You're two sessions in. It turns out. The best predictor of how well a person goes is how well they go in the first couple of sessions. So if you ask them at session two, yeah, they've had the first, they've had the, they've had a bit of treatment, but they've also had a bit of response. So they're now judging whether they are going to get better based on the fact that they're getting better. Which turns out to be quite a good way of judging that. So there is no pure measure of expectancies that's totally satisfactory. You've really got to ask them both of those things. Ask them at the beginning and ask them after they've had a little bit, being aware that neither of them is perfect. What do you do with missing data? And it turns out that's really hard to know. So did the person not come back for this follow-up assessment because they're doing worse and they're embarrassed and they don't want to tell you? Or are they not coming back because they're doing so well, forget about the treatment, forget about the study, and I'm doing, I don't want to see you anymore. I'm doing too well, I want to get on with my life now. Or are they the same as all the rest of them? We don't know. For this particular person, we have no idea. So what do we do? Well, what some people have done is say, look, let's, let's make some guesses about what the data is and make some data substitutions. And one of the most classic ones is to say, look, let's say they're the same as they were the last time I saw them. But they probably aren't the same as they were the last time I saw them. And what I did with a lot of my studies, and I think I might have that example, no, I haven't. You remember the one I showed you with the, with the, uh, the correspondence trial? That had a data substitution in it. What I did there was, if it was missing, I substituted the average score across everything. What that means is that if you've got nothing after the baseline, you're assuming that the same as baseline. You know, if you've got these two, you're assuming it's somewhere between there and the middle. I thought that was pretty good, actually. You can do better than that by having a regression approach. So you be looking at, you know, what kind of line can we best fit for people who are like them, and you can get really sophisticated and predict that from their baseline characteristics and so on. I mean, you can do that kind of thing. But increasingly, statisticians are saying, don't do any of that. Um, use an approach like mixed models approach, which doesn't actually substitute the missing data, but analyzes for everything you've got. So if you've got 50 people here, analyze all 50 of them in the analysis. You've only got 25 here. 25 are actually contributing to the estimation of what that mean is. Fix the problem? Well, no, because what it's suggesting is that these people are missing at random. Um, that in fact, there's, there's not something systematic going on there. 
But in, in fact, there may well be something quite systematic that's going on there with those people. So, bottom line is try not to lose people because there is no satisfactory way of dealing with lost time. Um, overall, control versus relevance, I said before, but you can actually maximise the relevance a bit more. So you can be less, um, you can be more inclusive with the people that you let in. Let some comorbidities in there. Let it be a bit more like what it is naturally if you can. So minimise that. So you might say, look, people have got to be able to read to be in this study, or they've got to be able to speak English, but apart from that, I don't care if you're born overseas, second language, whatever, um, they can be in the study. Um, the web treatments that we've been using uh, allow us to be more relevant because, in fact, they are like, they are like um, uh, dissemination or effectiveness trials in a way, because anybody can do them. So we can actually look at, um, look at how that is working more broadly. And you can actually do some testing in routine practice like we are in, in this one where we're rolling out um, e-mental health across, across Australia in primary care and, and looking at training people in using e-mental health resources effectively in their sessions and seeing that that works for them. Okay, look, there's other things I can say, but that's probably a good place to stop if you can see if anybody has <coughs>
but it does seem in, this, in, in those substance use trials, it does seem to make a difference to both whether they come uh, and then to ultimate outcome. But you've just got to be careful about that issue of are you paying for the clean urines? That's the risk then. You don't get maintenance with that. Um, It, it, of course, politically, can you imagine doing that in this country? You know, anybody who's got a drug problem will pay you um, 20, 20 pounds every time you come in uh, to come to a session. And it would be difficult to, to get people to see that as being appropriate. There'd be, there'd be people sort of saying, yeah, but I'm, you know, I should get 20 pounds because I'm, I'm not taking the drugs, you know, when you're accomplished. reasonably well for um, stress, anxiety, <coughs> dysphoria. It works really badly for psychotic symptoms. Um, so uh, there's a good reason for that because most drugs don't really work for the psychotic symptoms. What I meant is actually that they're using the substance in order to treat uh, mm. the issue in themselves. So that yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, look, put it another way. It's part of the way in which you ask the question. So, and if I say to you, okay, last time you had a drink, um, then what did you have that drink? And you may well say, well, it made me feel good. Okay, now what if you were having a stressful day yesterday and I asked you the question? And so, well, it kind of made me feel a bit less stressed, you know, I just felt a bit calmer. Okay, what if you were really depressed yesterday and I asked you the question? And so I felt just a little bit less depressed. Now, is that self-medication and the other one is just pleasure and having fun? It seems to me it's the same phenomenon. It's just the context in which you're asking the question. Yep. Do I hear the last five minutes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. You need to market your work, and, and ideally in a coherent way. I believe that does mean something. It doesn't mean anything to me. Um, and you need to consider the audience that you're marketing to. Um, so you're talking to scientists, practitioners, policymakers of the public. If, you, if you're talking to scientists, and, and many of us do, we just talk to scientists. Now, think, think about this. Let's say you get 50 citations to your work. Well, at least 50 people have read your work. Well, I don't know. Do you always read the work that you cite? <laughs> And, and how about if you subscribe to a journal, do you actually read it? Do you read it all? Do you read beyond the abstract? Uh, I think we need to keep our feet on the ground as to how many people actually read our work. Um, it's not necessarily as many as you might think. Um, and certainly practitioners are unlikely to be reading it because they're not interested in that. Very rarely are they interested in reading scientific work, but they don't have time. They like to read something which analyzes that, but they don't read the actual things as much. But if you, work, if you go into the practitioners ones, uh, there's a lot of kudos, isn't it? You don't get as many, there's many brownie points. The policy makers get funding of policies and they make lots of nice policies that doesn't really make any difference to practice. So there's that issue. Then there's the issue of just some practical things. We need to get funds where we can, don't we? Um, and at times it feels a bit like that when you get the funds. Um, and you know, absolutely. <laughs> but but it's also important that we don't get distracted from the main game. So we need to focus on our strengths um, and on the novelty, um, preferably not you know sort of looking backwards like that. Um, and the significance of what we're doing. And maybe blue sky, but not necessarily. We may think that we're sort of building something for eternity. The chances are we're not. Most of the time, we're just on the pathway, you know, just for the next little tiny step along the way. So, some brief things of advice now, save the successes when they come, um, but it's really important to value the null findings that you're getting in your research. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll feel like that sometimes, um, or even like that. 
I didn't doctor that, it's a real photo. Um, but I guess I'd like to suggest that. Um, that there is, why not do the research, you know, it's get out there and do it and be thinking about the positives and the outcomes that you're going to be getting. But above all, um, you're not just researchers, you people. Put the whole thing in perspective, for heaven's sake. Um, this is a view out of, right? Actually, that, I do own the view of the So, you know, there's a lot more to life than all of this, so just have a lot of fun with it.